Welcome to the March 2021 edition of Hunt Camp Mail. March is a slow month for hunters and fishermen here locally. You know, uh, deer and upland are out of season now. High Sierra trout season hasn't opened yet. And, you know, out in the salt water, it's still too cold for the good stuff. Luckily, spring turkey season is uh, coming up right at the end of this month. And I'm going to try to get out and try my luck at that. I've actually seen some turkeys on public land and I'm going to revisit those spots and uh, see if I can get lucky. But uh, private land, private ranches, especially on the central coast of California, are just loaded with turkeys. But uh, you kind of have to uh, find spots where they migrate off this private land on the public land. And uh, that's where you'll score. So I'm going to try to do that. Um, I also went out and did some rabbit hunting. And uh, the rabbits were plentiful. But uh, the great news is that I stumbled upon a piece of uh, public land that had just huge amounts of quail on it. So I can't wait to uh, get back out there in the fall and uh, get some quail because I am finding some new spots while I'm out scouting and rabbit hunting. Also, I thought I had another Africa hunt lined up for me, but the PH called me and advised me to cancel or reschedule because getting the required uh, PCR COVID-19 test results in time for my flight back to the United States was going to be very problematic. Um, and Air Namibia went out of business and canceled all of its flights this month, so... I'm just ready for all this COVID crap to be over finally. I also broke down and did a video on the 270 Winchester, which just seemed to anger the 270 bots even worse. I don't know if that did any good or not. I also broke from my usual channel content and did a video about some of the crazy comments I get on my YouTube channel. And uh, that seemed to be pretty well received. And I'll try to do some more lighthearted videos like that in the future. So... Let's start reading March's mail. Our first question is from Chris from British Columbia. Chris asked, as a fan of monometal bullets, have you any experience with hammer bullets? I heard about them through a podcast some time ago and was intrigued. Their design incorporates pedals, as do many monolithic bullets, but apparently these pedals are designed to shed as easily as possible. Well, it's actually pretty funny that you sent me this email because I actually ordered some ha some of the Hammer Hunter bullets, uh, the 220 grain bullets for my 35 Whalen that I'm going to try out. So, you know, I'm still waiting on them to get here, so I can't render any opinion of them yet, but... Uh, you know, let's see if we can confirm all the hype about these bullets. You know, uh, they're much more expensive than Barnes bullets. So, you know, I need to see a really good improvement in order to justify the cost of using these bullets. But I'm open-minded and willing to give them, you know, some objective testing. And I'll let you know how that goes when they arrive and I load them up. And our next question is from Chuck from Arizona. Chuck asked, Desert Dog, since guns are flying off the shelves as fast as they can make them, why are gun companies going out of business or selling off on a massive scale right now? Well, that's very observant of you, Chuck. And as you pointed out, it makes absolutely no sense. You know, lots of crazy things have been going on in the firearm industry. Remington went out of business completely sold off its inventory, and, you know, it's now owned by a company that flips real estate. <laughs> so I mean, who knows what the future of Remington is, you know? But how a company who has the number one selling shotgun in the world and the number one selling rifle in the world can go bankrupt during a pandemic where every firearm gets sold at double the markup is beyond me. You know, Remington might be the worst managed company out there since Enron. 
Um, also, Ruger bought Marlin, you know, which really surprised me. You know, and we'll see what happens there. Hopefully, Ruger lets Marlin continue to make quality forged firearms instead of using Ruger's casting processes. Um, also, uh, Colt just sold the CZ. That's right. Colt sold the CZ. You know, Colt's no longer an American-made company, and I never thought I'd see that in my lifetime. You know, hopefully CZ doesn't turn Colt into a budget-minded line of firearms like they have a history of doing. And what's even more mind-blowing than Colt selling to CZ is the recent sell of Holland & Holland to Beretta. That's right. The most iconic hunting firearm manufacturer in the world just sold to Beretta. You know, hopefully Beretta doesn't cheapen the name and legacy of that great firearm manufacturer. You know, it's still hard for me to grasp that Holland & Holland is owned by Beretta now. But uh, Beretta seems to be buying up European brands like crazy right now. They have been for the last 10 years. There were also rumors this month that the Montana Rifle Company was going to open their doors this year, but at a different location. But uh, it now looks like the Montana Rifle Company is completely out of business for good, which sucks because we lost another good controlled round feed rifle. You know, first the CZ-550, now the Montana. Not good, man. Everybody's looking to make a manufacture a, a cheaper product nowadays, and uh, controlled round feed doesn't really fit that mold. You know, hopefully FN keeps make, pumping out those Winchester Model 70s. So some companies like Remington and Montana went out of business due to gross mismanagement, especially Remington. Other companies are selling off because they feel it's the right time to do it. You know, with profits and sales at record levels right now in the firearm industry, it's a seller's market. And, uh, you know, I, I don't blame them for taking advantage of that right now, but it just sucks to lose a lot of uh, g great American firearms like Colt in uh, Montana and Remington. And our next question is from... Hubert in Argentina. Hubert asked, to shoot a three-shot group, I start with a cold barrel. How long do you wait for the second and third shot? You know, and it was actually a long letter from Hubert, and he indicated that where he lives in Argentina, ammo and reloading supplies are at a real, they're real scarce there. So they have to really uh, treat every single bullet, every single primer, every single piece of brass with the utmost uh, care and respect because they can't waste anything there. You know, it's probably worse than our situation here in the United States. So I feel for you, Hubert. But uh, on your question about uh, the three-shot groups, it depends really on the barrel profile, um, how fast the cartridge is, the ambient temperature, you know, and factors like that, if the barrel's a little warm, it's no big deal to shoot again when you're shooting for a three-shot group. But if you have a lightweight or sporter profile barrel, you definitely don't want to shoot groups from a barrel that's too hot to touch or even getting close to that. You know, I find it almost impossible to shoot a good, fast three-shot group with a really lightweight barrel. Usually the third shot will fly off from the group when you do that. So it's best to wait five to 15 minutes for the barrel to cool before firing the next shot. You know, I like to use those uh, battery powered barrel coolers to speed the process up. You know, I'll show you a little clip right here, one of those. But yes, it's best to let the barrel cool between shots when you're shooting for groups. You know, particularly with a lightweight hunting barrel. I might spend actually two to three hours at the range just to shoot 30 rounds for load development. So every aspect of load development really is a pain in the ass. There's just no shortcut to finding a good load. And if that means you have to wait an extra 10, 15 minutes between shots. I mean, that's what you have to do. You want accurate data. 
And our next question is from Howard from Las Vegas, Nevada. Howard asked, why is the NRA bankrupt? How could this happen? Well, there's a lot of people asking that right now, and there's a lot of answers out there, but I'm going to give you my take on this. You know, once again, with firearm ownership at an all-time high right now, and people willing to donate to fight anti-gun legislation, the NRA should have more money than it's ever had in its history right now. In my mind, here's the problem. You know, sure, there's lots of funds being wasted on extravagant spending, you know, like the NRA is being criticized for right now. I have no doubt that that's happening, and that's a bad thing. But to me, that's not the real issue. The real issue is that the NRA is employing an old strategy that used to work 25 years ago, but it no longer works today. Basically, they go by the old playbook of lobbying 101, which is basically to give money to politicians in exchange for their votes on certain issues. You know, all lobbying groups do this, not just the NRA, from labor unions to big pharma. The NRA, though, is currently stuck in a rut of being an outdated lobbying group. You know, this lobbying strategy used to work back when many Democrats were neutral about gun control. You know, hey, it's hard to believe nowadays, but, you know, 30 years ago, 25, 30 years ago, you know, a lot of Democrats were pro-gun, you know, they were, or at least neutral on gun control, wanted to hear a little bit of both sides. But nowadays, with very few exceptions, almost all the Democrats in Congress support gun control. So what the NRA is doing now is just pumping millions of dollars into the accounts of Republicans that are probably pro-gun anyways. You know, that's that's a complete waste of money. It's like paying your wife to sleep with you. In the modern battlefield of gun rights, wars are fought in the courts, not in Congress. You know, rather than blowing hundreds of millions of dollars on politicians who probably support the Second Amendment anyway, the NRA should be funding an army of the country's best lawyers and PR operations that bring facts about gun ownership to the masses. You know, the NRA has totally failed in this regard. And quite honestly, groups like the Gun Owners of America, the Second Amendment Foundation, and the California Rifle and Pistol Association have been doing things that the NRA should have been doing all along. But there's also an aspect to the situation that many aren't considering because of all of the, uh, the media hype surrounding this. New York is a very hostile state towards anything gun-related. You know, the state of New York is constantly attacking the NRA and other gun groups, and they have to spend lots of money defending themselves from attacks within their own state. You know, I personally believe that the bankruptcy is part of an exit strategy to get the hell out of New York and that the state of New York is trying to kill the NRA before they can leave the state and regroup in a free state. And our next question is from Bob from Ohio. Bob asked, do you have any other passionate hobbies aside from fishing and hunting? I don't know what I do without golf myself. That's actually a great question. You know, we we can't go through life just obsessed and focused with one thing. It's good to uh, divide our interest up among a lot of different things so you really don't burn out on one particular thing. But uh, to answer your question, Bob, um, I absolutely do have a lot of other hobbies. I'm an avid off-roader, and I love hot rods too. You know, I love working on engines and doing mechanical things. Um, I built a really badass rear steer rock buggy that I take on some of the most extreme rock crawling trails in the country. You know, here's some video of some action of that.
My wife and I also have built up Jeeps that we like to take back into remote places for camping, fishing, and hunting trips. Well, we got a campsite. <laughs> and it is snowing pretty hard up here right now. And, uh... And, uh, it was a fun day. You can see on this, my winch is frozen solid. <laughs> and I also love hot rods, especially Mustangs. I have a 1970 Mustang that I basically built from the ground up. I dropped a Ford Racing Crate engine in it a couple of years ago, and I'm getting ready to add a I also have a 2013 Mustang GT that's built to be a sleeper street rod, you know, and it's one fast car. So when I'm not working, loading ammo, tinkering with guns, hunting, or fishing, you'll often see me welding, grinding, and turning wrenches in my garage. And our next question is from Case. Case wrote, My father passed and there is a Mauser that's sitting in a sibling's closet that no one has interest in but me. So the only thing I know about it is that he said it was a 7 millimeter, but which specific caliber he didn't say. And that he has never shot it. Would need to go to a gunsmith to determine exact caliber and functionality before firing. What would be the best source to determine what this rifle is? Well, case, um, many surplus Mausers have the caliber or cartridge stamped on the barrel, but not all of them. Um, it could be an old Spanish Mauser chambered in 7 by 57 if he said it was a 7 millimeter. But, uh, but then again, the barrel might be stamped uh, 7.91 millimeter, which means it's an 8 millimeter Mauser. You know, if, if it's uh, been fitted with an aftermarket barrel, the chambering should be stamped on the barrel, but you never know. You know, a lot of this was done by home machinists back in the day, especially since it's an old Mauser. So uh, if it isn't marked at all, a gunsmith will need to take a chamber cast with uh, a product called Serosafe and carefully measure the dimensions. You know, this might cost you more than the rifle's worth, but it really is the only reliable way to, uh, to know what you have if uh, the barrel isn't marked. Okay, and our next question is from David in Florida. David stated, I've got an old Mauser or two and a 1903 Springfield likewise picked up cheap at a gun show many years ago. I've been thinking about using one of these as a base to build a 35 Wayland hunting rifle on, but need to find the right guy to hire for the project. It seems that so many of the older 
Experienced gunsmiths, I know, have either retired or passed on, which is a shame. You know, Dave, uh, this is a shame and a loss to the hunting world that we'll never be able to recover, in, you know, in my opinion. All of the best gunsmiths that I've personally known in my lifetime are no longer with us. You know, uh, when I started my old YouTube channel, I got absolutely slammed with letters from local California hunters that wanted me to do work for them. You know, usually simple jobs like bedding a rifle or uh, changing barrels. And it made no sense to me as to why they were so desperate to get a rifle bedded that they were, you know, contacting some guy on YouTube and asking him to do it. I mean, every gunsmith in town does that, right? Actually, I was wrong in my thinking. They don't anymore. I found out that all the gunsmiths within 100 miles of my house no longer bed rifles. You know, no gunsmith within 200 miles of my house will rebarrel a pre-64 Model 70 or a Mauser. Absolutely nobody within 300 yards of me will do checkering on a stock. And I basically found two reasons for this. Reason number one is that the great gunsmiths of the past were expert machinists. You know, they came from a day when machinists made absolutely everything by hand. And, you know, rather than CNC machines or automated processes, and most goods were produced right here in the United States with American labor. So expert machinists were everywhere and actually very common. You know, every man in my family, from my great grandfather to me, knew their way around a lathe and a mill. But uh, those days are gone now. Many of the gunsmiths coming out of uh, school now only have a couple dozen hours of training in the machine shop. You know, uh, one of the gunsmiths in my town got his gunsmithing certificate from watching DVDs on his computer and, you know, and then applied for his FFL license and now has the word gunsmithing in his business name. So skilled craftsmen and machinists are in very limited supply nowadays and are actually quite rare in the gunsmithing world nowadays. And reason number two is just pure economics. Modern Americans are becoming cheap entitled bastards. I hate to say that, but they are. You know, they expect people to give them goods and services without regard for profit anymore. You know, especially the millennial. But uh, completely refinishing a stock, you know, including stripping, uh, sanding, finishing, checkering, and fitting might take weeks to do. You know, it's something that might take over a thousand dollars of your time and materials to do, but no one wants to pay more than a few hundred dollars because they can simply go out and buy a new stock for that much. You know, nobody wants to pay thirteen hundred dollars to get an old rifle rebarreled, trued, bedded, and trigger work done. You know, when they can go a buy a new Tika off the shelf for half of that. So to really make money fixing guns, you have to pick the easy, quick jobs that don't cost the customer a lot of money and don't uh, uh, require a large time expenditure for the gunsmith to complete. You know, as a result, most smiths nowadays just want to work on AR-15s, 1911s, you know, Model 700s and Glocks. You know, honestly, it's really not a great field to get into if you want to make money. You know, you do a ton of work that you won't really be getting paid for. So, yeah, you know, if uh, if you got a good gunsmith handy for you right now, enjoy them while you can because they're a dying breed. And our next question is from Joe. You know, Joe wrote me a pretty long letter about converting an old 375 H&H rifle over to either 404 Jeffrey or, 4, or 416 Remington Magnum. And uh, he can't decide which cartridge to choose between uh, 404 and 416 Rem Mag. 
You know, Joe, the uh, the 404 has great performance, mild recoil, and is one of the coolest and most nostalgic cartridges you could bring to Africa. The drawbacks are lack of versatility because of the basically the bullet selection is very limited with those. And brass is also expensive and hard to find. But uh, honestly, shooting either the A-frames, TSXs, or Woodleys that are available for the 404 should handle all your needs for that. The 416 Rem Mag will be way less nostalgic, but it'll be much more practical and versatile. So it's your pick. Nostalgia or practicality? Our next question is from Elmer Fudd. That's right. Elmer Fudd wrote me. Elmer Fudd wrote, I am contemplating bio, buying a Model 70 Extreme Tuxton and 243 Win. Have you had a chance to examine this particular model? If so, what's your opinion on it? Well, Elmer Fudd, unfortunately, I haven't shot the Extreme Tungsten model yet, but uh, it does look like a nice gun. But uh, I really can't comment on it because I haven't handled one or shot one. But uh, Elmer Fudd, I hope you get those wascally wabbits. And our next question is from William from Minnesota. William wrote, I am considering an African Plains game hunt, and I was wondering if you could recommend a few of your outfitters. Any advice you can give me would be greatly appreciated. I'm a, d a retired dentist seeking to fulfill a few items on my bucket list before it's too late. Perhaps it would be a good idea for a video of what airlines to use, what countries you feel are safe, and maybe even recommend a few outfitters you've used in the past. Well, I want to thank you for the letter, William, and... Also, many thanks to your profession. I had an excruciating toothache last month, and my dentist did an emergency root canal on me and just made the world right again. You know, I've had broken bones, including my femur and my collarbone, a six-inch gash in my skull, a bleeding ulcer, bad burns. You know, I had a dengue fever from a trip to the jungles of South America, food poisoning multiple times, ringing ear damage, you know, and a lot of kicks to the balls doing martial arts. And there's absolutely nothing on this earth more excruciating than a bad toothache. And you guys are the unsung and unappreciated heroes of society, in my opinion. You know, uh, especially the dentist working through this whole COVID disaster to help people that are in pain, you know, and I want to say thank you to all the dentists out there. You know, uh, you men and women don't get enough credit for what you do. But now to answer your question, William, um, information about Africa, in my mind, is a moving target. Politics, regulations, and safety concerns are constantly evolving on the African continent. You know, current government regulations, airline schedules, hunting conditions, and overall safety can never be reliably quantified from year to year, you know, and even month to month right now. Two years ago, I would have told you to stay away from British Airways and to fly South American Air. I mean, South African Air. But uh, today, just the opposite is true. I wouldn't touch South African Air. And uh, my last trip on British Airways was fantastic. So, you know, if, if uh, you told anybody years ago, that Zimbabwe would be a much safer and stable place than South Africa, nobody would have believed you. So any video I make with recommend recommendations for any business would uh, probably be outdated within a year. I mean, just to give you an example, one year when I was preparing for a trip to Zambia, hunting and firearm regulations changed three times before I took that trip. So Trying to pin down what country or airline is best at any particular time is kind of an, a futile effort, in my opinion. You know, so 
If I made a video recommending certain things to you, it would quickly be outdated and wouldn't give my subscribers accurate information. You know, even with PHs, you know, they, uh, they retire or, you know, get injured and leave the field or die or, you know, just uh, move on to something else all the time. So if I recommend a certain PH, you know, who's to say they're going to be there five years from now? Also, don't choose an outfitter because of me. You know, I like to be off the beaten path and like challenging hunts. So choose an outfitter based off of your expectations. You know, your preferred level of comfort, your budget, and your physical abilities. You know, the high-fenced game ranches in South Africa and Namibia suit the needs of most people, honestly. But some folks want, you know, more challenge and adventure, and it's all up to you. Our next question is from Mike from Belgium. Mike wrote, as a Belgian hunter, a lot of my hunting property consists of farmland where vegetables are grown in which I'm responsible for crop damage. Because of COVID-19, a lot of people are going for hikes these days. Unfortunately, a lot of people ignore the private property signs and just take their dogs without a leash, without a leash into nature. They feel they are entitled to walk freely on my property and start throwing all sorts of nasty comments at me when they see me shooting pigeons, like murderer and ruthless killer. I try explaining to them that the meat I shoot is clean and honest harvested meat. They tell me that's unnecessary because they're vegetarian. I then tell them that it's just because of those vegetables that I'm standing there to shoot pigeons. If you really want vegetables where no animals have died for, you can only grow them in your own backyard. Often they act surprised because they never even thought about that. Well, what you're experiencing is the modern leftist mindset, you know, where pure emotion and fake outrage override logical thought and the evaluation of the facts. You know, it used to be a European and Latin American problem, but now it's a global problem. You know, decades of socialist indoctrination have rendered people, you know, under government, corporate, and media control by, you know, playing on their emotions and their sense of victimhood. Leftists literally go through life actively searching for things to be offended about. You know, first, they were offended that you own a beautiful piece of private property and they don't. You know, then they were offended by the fact that you were killing birds. And lastly, they were offended by the fact that you aren't a vegetarian like them. You know, if you spend another hour with these people, you'd undoubtedly offend them in a hundred different ways, you know, besides the way you already offended them. You know, I feel that these leftists are past the point of caring about facts or logic. Trust me, trying to educate them or set them straight doesn't really work anymore. You know, the only way to deal with them is to not give in to their bullshit. You know, they're, they're used to crying and being offended over everything and getting their way as a result. You know, reasonable people need to grow a spine and stop giving in to their demands. You know, but, but you stood your ground you didn't apologize for anything, and you set them straight. And that's uh, exactly what you need to do when you deal with people like that. So good job. And our next question is from Jorgen from Alberta, Canada. Jorgen wrote, which 165 grain Hornady projectile would you choose as a general purpose load intended for bear encounters, elk, moose, deer, or antelope hunts. I have the interlocks, inner bonds, and GMX on the shelf. I am leaning towards the inner bonds as I believe they would open better on light frame game, yet retain penetration enough for larger frame game. Please let me know your thoughts. Well, to me, all three of those bullets are proven killers. And since you'll be hunting everything from antelope to moose, 
The 165 grain bullet is probably a great all-around choice. It's very versatile. Since moose and possibly bears are on the menu, I'd skip the interlock, which is a good bullet for thin-skinned game. But uh, I don't know if I'd go out moose or bear hunting with it. The GMX would be better for moose, no doubt. But the inner bombs are also a great all-around bullet. You know, I personally, I'd see what your barrel likes the best between the inner bond and the GMX, and I choose that bullet. And our next question is from Wayne. Wayne asked. I'm having sticker shock on a used 35 Wayland on Gunbroker. What is your thoughts on reboring a Mauser style action 30 out 6 to 35 Wayland? Well, you can have any 30 out 6 reboard to 35 Wayland as long as the barrel profile is uh, thick enough to shoot a 35 caliber bullet, basically. Some really lightweight barrels are too skinny to reboard a 35 caliber. But honestly, it's just a little bit more money to have your rifle completely rebarreled to 35 Wayland. And that way you get a nice new match grade barrel with a fresh chamber on it, you know, to start with. I bought an old 30 out six with a warm barrel at a gun show for a hundred dollars a few months back. And I'm currently rebarreling that to 35 Wayland. You know, Except for my single shot uh, CVA Scout in 35 Wayland, none of my other 35 Wayland rifles started life as a 35 Wayland. They were all uh, rebored or rebarreled. Our next question is from Luis from California. Luis wrote, Lately I've been taking a hard look at choosing and supporting a conservation organization and becoming a member. In the process, I've read about so-called green decoys, which are left-wing foundations that use sportsmen as a cover to push other agendas. Is there any organization that you recommend a lifelong deer hunter to look into supporting? If not a recommendation, any of your input would be greatly appreciated. Well, Luis, you're right, you have to be careful. There's a lot of leftist organizations that try to trick hunters and anglers into supporting them. You know, that way they can use the hunters as an endorsement to pass legislation. You know, they can pass some stupid law that hurts hunting and say, oh, even all these hunters support it. You know, I know in the past they've gotten organizations like Ducks Unlimited and Pheasants Forever. They've basically been honey dicked into uh supporting legislation that hurt hunting ultimately. But, uh, you know, uh, many hunters in our own state of California got tricked into supporting leftist front groups that were pushing the lead ammunition ban. You know, many unsuspecting fishermen in our state got tricked into supporting groups that helped close fisheries down and hatcheries down. You know, leftist front groups like American Hunters and Shooters Association are actually anti-Second Amendment groups whose sole purpose is to advocate for gun control in disguise as a hunting group. You know, basically, the left has been conducting a media and PR campaign for years aimed at turning hunters against the NRA and trying to propagate a false narrative that hunters actually want gun control. But those of us who actually hunt and know other hunters know that this is 100% false and not the truth. Hunters are actually the biggest proponents of the Second Amendment. And we do a great job of purging FUDs like Jim Zumbo from our own ranks. Like them or hate them, groups like the Dallas Safari Club and SCI or Safari Club International have funded countless legal battles for the benefit of the hunter in California. You know, uh, personally, I would not have been able to receive my last batch of African trophies if it wasn't for SCI's legal team. You know, as I speak right now, SCI is in California fighting a dog breeding ban that would uh, negatively affect hunters. The NRA, like them or hate them, also vigorously fought for hunting rights in our state. 
You know, they spent millions fighting against California lead ban and even recently threw huge resources into our state to fight the statewide uh, bear hunting ban. So don't give up on the NRA just yet. The Sportsmen's Alliance is another great organization that protects hunters. And the great thing about the Sportsmen's Alliance is they will never support any form of gun control. But it's really good to be vigilant because uh, you really have to watch hunting organizations that buddy up with groups like the Sierra Club and the Audubon Society. You know, on one hand, they play to hunters. And on the other hand, they play to groups like PETA. You know, in California, I've watched hunters team up with uh, the Sierra Club to ban off rotors from public land. Well, it didn't take long for the mountain bikers and horses to be banned also. You know, then eventually hunting and fishing got banned. So hunters who support the Sierra Club are like the Catholic priests who supported Hitler while he was rounding up the Jews. Don't trust them because you're next. Our next question is from Mike from North Carolina. Mike asked, Desert Dog, why does Barnes make a 165 grain and a 168 grain TTSX bullet in 30 caliber? I see a slight difference in BC. Well, that's a great question, Mike. Um, the 165 grain TTSX has a much shorter nose profile on it. So cartridges that need a relatively short overall length bullet, like the 300 Win Mag, can better utilize it. By contrast, the 168 grain TTSX has a longer, more streamlined profile to take advantage of higher BCs, but you really need a cartridge that allows the bullet to be seated out a little bit further. The 30 6 is a good example of a cartridge that lets you do that. According to Barnes, the 168 grain TTSX will open better at lower velocities because of the difference in design. Most 30 6 rifles have enough magazine length and headspace to seat the 168 grain TTSX bullets, you know, as far out as you want to with, uh, without any issues. This makes the 168 grain TTSX the natural choice for your 30 out six. And our last question is from Gail in Nevada. Gail wrote, Desert Dog, it seems like the next type of hunting the liberals are attacking is coyote and predator hunting. I noticed several states are trying to ban coyote hunting contests, and there's talk of banning coyote hunting altogether. Even where I live, in Clark County, Nevada, people are rallying to put an end to coyote hunting. Even the liberals in California want to stop predator hunting altogether. These people are foolish and have no idea what is happening outside their downtown apartments. Since people have brought water, agriculture, and trash to the middle of the desert, Coyote populations have exploded and need to be controlled. Well, you're absolutely 100% right, Gail. You know, what's happening right now is that the leftists feel emboldened to do anything because they can get away with anything right now. Basically, they're trying to find something to get outraged about over and over, you know, until anything conservatives do is banned. You know, it's a byproduct of, you know, the current runaway cancel culture that we're experiencing right now. You know, eventually it'll backfire on themselves and they'll be targeted by their own people. And while all of this is going on, logic, reason and sound conservation principles are completely ignored and disregarded. And society is just running on pure emotion right now. A couple months ago. I read a subscriber's letter on Hunt Camp Mail asking me to do a predator hunting video showing how it's a necessary attribute of wildlife conservation, which it is. You know, I personally don't hate coyotes or any other animals. Well, 
except for uh, mosquitoes and yellow jackets, especially those freaking yellow jackets. As a matter of fact, I have great respect and admiration for the coyote, you know. And even though I hunt them occasionally, I don't lose sight of this. Some people hate coyotes so bad that they want to wipe them off the face of the earth. You know, they spit on them and they'll even run them over with a vehicle on purpose, you know, and they seem to get enjoyment out of it, which is unethical and borderline psychotic by my standards. You know, other folks want to protect the coyote and give them special game status, which is also flat out stupid, in my opinion. Really, I have so much to add to this argument, including video evidence, that I think this topic deserves a future video of its own. And uh, I'll start working on, uh, you know, getting something together when I get the time, but it's a, uh, it's a great topic for a video. Well, that uh, pretty much wraps up uh, March 2021 edition of Hunt Camp Mail. I also want to thank Lee in the Philippines, Steve in Texas, Alex in Florida, Paul in the UK, Andrew in Texas, Mike, Mark, and Victor for your kind words and well wishes. I hope everyone has a fantastic Easter and that your Easter baskets are packed with goodies. And you actually find all the eggs that you hid in your backyard. And just to let you know what I have in the works for April, I have another Rimfire video coming up next month showcasing my personal favorite Rimfire cartridge. I'm also going to give you some more shotgun stuff and maybe do a little video log on the road trip I'm taking through seven states next month, you know, with the goal of visiting my son in Montana and visiting my grandparents' graves in Neely, Idaho. Well, if you have any questions or comments, send them to me at DesertDogOutdoors at gmail.com. Be sure to subscribe if you enjoy my content. And as always, thank you for watching and good hunting.